exacerbate land tenure tension, in general at the expense of the more vulnerable local communities. And one thing is very clear, is that we need to avoid large-scale transformation of self-sustaining communities into food-dependent, landless wage laborers. What does that mean? And what uh, 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 it means in terms of adaptation of our policies? We'll see that in the last part of my presentation. But before going into that, and before I got informed that I only have five minutes, um, let me also uh, uh, stress that what I just said on developing countries, of course, is one side of the equation. And we strongly believe in Europe that developing countries have a fantastic natural competitive advantage in biofuel production. It's clear when you see the map, you have the great privilege, some of you, from living in the tropical climate. I would love to uh, share that privilege with you. And uh, 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 moving into biofuel is clearly an asset that uh, some countries, such as Brazil, have already explored. And if adequately redistributed, revenues coming from biofuel can help resolve nutrition problems. And the development of a biofuel industry can also stimulate the local agro-industry and the local food production. Brazil, which managed to boost its agricultural production in parallel with its ethanol production, is a good example. Uh, and let me just mention also that uh, this inflation in, wood in, 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 in food prices, to a certain extent, is also good news for the 70% of the world's poor who live in rural areas and earn their income from farming. But what's the response to uh, uh, this fuel versus food debate? And let me go through it in the four minutes that I have now. First, we in Europe do not believe that a moratorium on biofuel could be a viable solution. It's very clear that a moratorium on biofuel would have no significant effect on food prices and would be really problematic as far as our fight against um, uh, uh, emission of ozone depletion gas is concerned. So it would be a lose-lose solution. We believe we need to have first a market response to address the food aspect of the issue. Market response, meaning concluding the Doha round, and we were in a position to sign uh, together with Brazil uh, the last draft of this agreement. Addressing the market for, uh, 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 aspect of the equation also means increasing food production in Europe, and we have taken some technical um, uh, decision to that, to that effect. But we also need to have a look at the fuel and bioethanol uh, aspect of the equation. And here, we have decided to monitor very closely the evolution of the food prices market, not only in Europe, but in the exporting countries. And we have decided to report we European Commission on a regular basis every two years to the Parliament and the Council to share our assessment of the impact that our uh, extensive uh, uh, future use of biofuel could have on food production. And eventually, we would be allowed to propose corrective actions if we see that we have problems. That's one aspect of the response. The other one is, of course, the dedication that we have towards uh, financing research for second and third generation biofuel. We strongly believe that there is a pot fantastical potential to tap there. And as far as the development side of the equation is concerned, we are working to include in all our uh, development policy a window for energy um, um, uh, finance project. And here, what we are looking at is to favor the production in our emerging developing countries partner of sustainable biofuel production so as to avoid the effect in terms of 
land substitution that I just talked about. And by the way, we are not working in isolation from Brazil, we are also working in project of promoting triangular cooperation, Brazil, EU, and Africa. Conclusion. The, there were many alarmist statements attributing last year to biofuel the cause of the surge in world prices, and we think most of those statements weren't over the, over the top. However, the risk exists that biofuel, if not adequately produced, could have negative impacts not only on food prices, but on the environment. This is why we in Europe choose to favor imports of sustainable biofuel. In a nutshell, and I want to repeat that, Europeans are already convinced of the merits of consuming and importing biofuels. The main thing for those who want to export to Europe is now to put in place and implement credible cert certification systems that guarantees that the ethanol we consume is sustainable. And let me conclude um, by uh, talking about Brazil and by stressing that, you know, this debate about the merits of having a sustainable um, uh, sustainable um, uh, sustainability schemes is a little bit over by now. Why? We already have our scheme in place, and Brazil actually is close to implement its own sustainability scheme. Brazil is already developing its own sustainability scheme, and Brazilian companies are already active on that front. So the problem is not on the opportunity to have a sustainability scheme. Countries such as Brazil is on the verge of implementing its own. The question now is to make this sustainability scheme compatible with, it, with each other. And as soon as Brazil or Brazilian companies would be ready with their own sustainability scheme, the European Commission is willing and ready to engage into a discussion to guarantee that our respective schemes fit well together. The last thing we want to do is to create new trade barriers. The thing we want to do is to have a common approach to these problems. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fabian, for your uh, thoughts and sharing with us um, your conclusions on your analysis and assessment of the recent trends uh, related to the impacts of food or basically biofuels on food prices and, and food availability. And I welcome your, uh, one of your last conclusions on the need to tackle this issue uh, from a uh, standpoint of uh, long-term monitoring those numbers and the statistics in which you will have a sound information uh, based on, on mechanisms that will be um, clearing uh, the, the misunderstandings on, on these issues that, we are, we ha that have a confounding effect. I think that will be necessary that uh, you could be uh, addressing and understanding these issues uh, from the long-term uh, perspective rather than just the short trends that are uh, on food prices that are more the drivers are beyond the uh, tendency of uh, growth of uh, biofuels currently. So thank you. And, and probably the question that we'll pose to you to thank uh, for the debate is um, uh, to what extent how much uh, Europe could uh, growth in terms of food production, in terms of area avail available, as well as in terms of biofuels, and what will be uh, the impacts of implementing uh, the, the biofuels directive in terms of uh, future markets for biofuels in the world? What is going to be the impacts if actually you implement those targets uh, set by December 208 now? Uh, so this is for your thoughts and, and discussions. Uh, next speaker is um, Ismael Perina. He's the director and president of the largest uh, sugarcane network association in Brazil, named Orplana. Orplana comprises 15,000 sugarcane producers 
and crushes approximately 130 million tons of sugarcane a year, which is not a small scale uh, enterprise. So uh, Mr. Pedina will be discussing and sharing with you some of the um, ideas, alternatives, and practice that our Plana associates are conducting in Brazil, especially in the central south of Brazil. So uh, welcome, Mr. Pedina. É, muito bom dia, obrigado, Hebe, muito bom dia aos colegas da mesa, bom dia a todos. É, inicialmente, eu gostaria muito de agradecer à Única que, pelo convite né, de poder estar aqui compartilhando algumas das, das coisas que a gente vem vivenciando nesses últimos anos. É, como todos sabem, o debate alimento e combustível ele é muito grande e a gente vai tentar aqui mostrar um pouquinho que algumas saídas são possíveis e a gente acredita muito no modelo brasileiro de produção, porque ao longo da palestra vocês vão ter a resposta. É, inicialmente, eu, eu gosto muito de apresentar esse pano de fundo, é, por conta de estar aqui o que ele resumo do que a gente acha que é o ideal é, para a produção de combustível e, e mostra realmente o que, que nós estamos fazendo, boa parte dos produtores, com relação a essa questão. Nós podemos ver aqui, desculpe, nós podemos ver aqui uma grande área de produção de cana, encravada na maior região produtora de cana do país, né, onde nós temos aqui todo em verde a, a produção de cana. Temos aqui, nessa área marrom, mais claro um pouco, a, a produção de alimentos, ou seja, uma produção que eu vou estar falando um pouquinho mais adiante, de, de amendoim para consumo, basicamente, de alimentação humana. Temos aqui já uma área sendo plantada cana e aqui uma área já plantada de cana, fazendo com que um ciclo se torne extremamente viável a produção dos, uh, e compatível a produção de cana e alimento. E aqui toda uma área de um riacho, de um rio, conservada, né? boa parte dela reflorestada e uma parte já abandonada ou esperando reflorestamento natural ou prestes a ser é, reflorestada artificialmente. Então, esse é, é o enfoque que a gente vê como a produção brasileira daqui para frente em, em toda a sua área. Falar um pouquinho da Orplana. A Orplana está tá, tá centralizada no estado de São Paulo, na, na, no município de Piracicaba, e ela tem um foco na região centro-sul do país. Estão associados conosco lá 29 associações. Inicialmente, ela, foi, ela nasceu no estado de São Paulo. É, há uns sete anos, abrimos os estatutos. Temos representantes no estado de Minas Gerais, é, Goiás e Mato Grosso. Né? É, como o Weber disse, somos 15 mil produtores, aproximadamente, 107 milhões de toneladas de produtores que fazem parte das associações vinculadas à Orplana e talvez umas 25 a 30 milhões de toneladas de produtores que ainda não, não estão associados a nenhuma associação e, e, e não estão não está fazendo parte desse componente de cana da, da Orplana. Voltar muito a insistir, esse quadro foi muito apresentado, mas que para nós, produtores de cana, não é interessante ir para a Amazônia. A Amazônia, para a produção de cana, é inviável do ponto de vista de qualidade de cana para a produção de açúcar e álcool. Então, se está difícil hoje aqui, com os baixos preços do etanol e transferindo, assim, baixos preços para a cana de açúcar, na Amazônia nós não teríamos a mínima chance de sobrevivência como produtores rurais. É... 